Hello everybody, Steven here with Cardboard Coalition. And if you were watching this video on the day that it released, welcome to the second part of the double feature. If you're not, know that there is an actual video that goes over the core box hero classes. But for today, we figured we would go over the hero classes for the three other hero um, classes. That sounds redundant, but the hero classes for the three other sets of heroes um, that come in the game, right? So these are hero and monster sets and they each one of these come with at least one new hero class, if not two hero classes. So what we're going over today are the monks, the necromancers, and this comes in the monks and necromancers versus paragon, the bards and tinkers, which comes in the bards and tinkers versus the metal angel, and the druids, which comes in the druids versus Beelzebub. All right, setting up the Necromancer. So to set up the Necromancer, you wanna go ahead and make sure that you give the Soul Tracker and the Soul Tracker token, you put it next to the Necromancer's hero board, which obviously we don't have out right now. You make sure that they have their deck of skill cards. They will go ahead and look at the three um, number one skills, level one skills, and they will decide which one they want. Once they decide that, they're gonna go ahead and put that skill right next to the soul track and put the other skills back in the stack. You wanna give the player at the Necromancer the three leader binding tokens and the one um, roaming monster binding token. So what is kinda of interesting about this character is you also give them the mob card for the skeletons and you wanna give them the level one to two mob card, all right? Then they get all the skeletons, you can go ahead and put them out there. You could take the leader if you wanted to and put them out. The leader is considered right now to be in the discard. You'll understand what I mean by that, but he is he's deceased, but he can be brought up. All right, we'll put him here to get him in shot. So how the Necromancer works, or the Soul Track, as it were, is that every time there is an enemy killed, things happen. So this is how it works. Whenever the Necromancer kills a enemy miniature, that can be minions, that can be bosses, or not bosses, that can be minions and leaders, it can be roaming monsters. Whenever that happens, they will get one soul just for getting rid of that enemy miniature. So any of those miniatures, one soul instantly. All right, whenever a leader is killed, Whenever a leader, it doesn't have to be the skeleton leader, so whenever a leader is killed by either the necromancer or anybody else, they get two points for a leader being killed. So two points for anyone killing a leader. And then for anyone killing a roaming monster, they get four points or four souls. So if someone kills a roaming monster, they would get four souls. Now, Remember that if the necromancer kills a leader, right? It could be the skeleton, it could be any leader. If a necromancer kills a leader, they get one soul for killing an enemy miniature plus the two souls for a leader. So if a necromancer killed a leader, they get one soul for killing the miniature and two more souls because they killed a leader because someone killed a leader. Just keep that in mind. All right. So how do we go ahead and get um, things to happen on this soul tracking board. If you notice at certain points, there are bonuses that you can get. As soon as the soul tracking token gets to that point or past it, they get to do that special ability. And this can go all the way over to 14. If any, if the necromancer would gain souls past 14, what they end up doing is getting mana up to their max, they can get mana up to their max, and their um, XP points if they get them for killing stuff. So let's go ahead and talk about this. So if they're at max, they get all these skills. When they do things, they spend souls, so they drop down, right? So we can use this as an example. Let's say they're at five. When they attack, they get this extra attack option. So it is um, spend a mana, get one attack added to your roll. Now, if they were to get some skeletons out, which would cost them two, they would drop that down. They would no longer have this because they've dropped down. This track goes up and down. 
All right, so the other thing that the Necromancer can do, which is really fun, is the Necromancer can raise the dead, and that's why you get these skeleton ones. So there are certain cards that allow the Necromancer to raise skeletons, and it says right here you got raise skeletons, and to um, raise leaders and raise monsters. So if the Necromancer raises skeletons, they would have to use their card, which on here, if you can see, it tells you the Necromancer would spend two souls to summon one skeleton, right? The skeleton always follows the leader around, right? And then whenever the leader would take a wound, so if this Necromancer takes a wound, they take that wound and they lose the skeleton that they summoned. Now, skeletons are always in the same zone as the Necromancer. They never move on their own. They always move around with the Necromancer. They stick with the Necromancer. They stay in their zone. Like I said, whenever the Necromancer is hit, they lose a point. The skeleton, you also take one skeleton away from that zone. Now, the skeletons don't have any weapons on them, right? These skeletons, just the regular minions, don't have any weapons. What you get to do is before you attack, you get to roll the black enemy dice first for the amount of skeletons you have in your zone with you. So let's say you have one skeleton in the zone with you, you roll one, two, two, so on and so forth. Now, if the skeletons kill a minion, the necromancer gets the points. Whenever a skeleton's killed, they're just taken off the board and put over here. This card stays here. Now, when it comes to leaders, right, any kind of leader, a necromancer has to have a skill to be able to bind a leader. And you actually get those when you get to level two, or once you decide to look at your level twos, you have leader rebirth and you have a monster rebirth that you can find in your level twos. So just so we can play through this, let's go ahead and set these out. Let's say our necromancer has all these skills out at this point. If there is any leaders in a discard pile, so the leaders have come out, someone has killed that leader, putting that card in the discard pile, the necromancer is allowed to um, bring rebirth. So a rebirth a leader, that sounds weird, resurrect a leader. Right? And how that would happen is they spend their souls. So this says uh, action four souls, spend four souls, right? And you revive a leader, place it in your zone, right? And then you equip the leader with the weapon. So if let's say they get this leader out, right? You kind of set it anywhere. I'm just trying to keep space here. You go ahead and take the binding token. You set it underneath the leader. And you give the leader one of your weapons cards. Now, the skeletons and the leader, they don't get their special abilities. The leader gets um, two activations. Well, they can have multiple activations, but they get one free activation. When the leader first comes into your zone, they get one free activation. They can move or they can attack. Now, the, and if you want them to do any more, you would have to spend your own action tokens to get them to move or attack. So when a leader attacks, they also don't get their special ability, but they can roll dice based on what the attack is. And the weapon that they have on them is the weapon that the leader either has in their equipment or in their inventory. So the leader, the, the um, necromancer has to have the weapon. They give a weapon to the um, leader now, it doesn't mean that they can still trade this weapon, they can do whatever they want with this weapon, but they give it to the reader, leader so they have some kind of attack. Now, the leaders count as heroes for moving and attacking. So they can attack with an action point, they can move, and when they move, they get two movement points. What the leaders cannot do is they can't open doors, they can't interact with objects, they can't carry things. Stuff like that. All they can do, just keep in mind, is move and attack. Now, unlike the skeletons that have to stay in the zone with the necromancer, leaders get to move around the board. Now, I'm going to go ahead and talk about 
the roaming monsters as well. Roaming monsters work the same way. So you have this card, right? Monster Reborn. And what it says is you spend six of your souls and you can revive one roaming monster and you place it in your zone, right? So the things that are a little bit different with the roaming monster is the health. You get, it's one hero value. So whatever the, the monster is, you go ahead and you can take that card out and you put it next to your setup. Whatever the health on the monster is, is the health for one hero, even if you're playing two. So it says three per hero. So this roaming monster would have three health. Now, another thing that you might notice with these cards is it tells you a limit at the bottom, a limit of one monster, right? Revived roaming monster, revived leader, a limit of one. Now, as you bump these cards up as well, you can bump it up, this up. You can have up to three leaders on the board. It takes actually the um, Necromancer level six skill that allows you to have three leaders, as you can see down here on the board. You would only use these in campaign. In the quest, you can only get up to two leaders out. Now, just like the leaders, they don't use any of these special actions right here. The only thing they do is they move and they attack. They move just like heroes. One action point allows them to move two spaces. And when they attack, they would roll the dice that are here. If they have to defend, they roll the dice that are here. They're treated for minion attacks, for everything as heroes, basically. Except for just like the leaders, can't open doors, they can't interact, interact with things, they can't carry things. Now, if you have a leader or a minion that's out on the board and you pull an upgraded card, all you do is you swap out that card. If you already have your limit of leaders, same with this one, you would just swap out the card for the next level, right? So let's say, right, we draw the next level for this person. You would just swap out the cards. Now, you cannot pull another creature. You can only, you have to stay within your limits. So right here, you can only have one leader out. And with this spell, you can only have one monster out. There's no, there's always one monster, but you can get up to, like I said, three leaders. If you want another leader out, you have to let the leaders that you have out, your, your max, if you're at max, you have to let a leader die. And then you can bring another leader out, right? If the leader dies, you put these cards in the discard pile, whatever card goes with that minion. This weapon gets to go back to the Necromancer, right? Now, if the skeletons, if you ever pull the next skeleton card, you what you would do is instantly replace that card like this, and then you would draw another card so a new mob would come out. So if you ever get a skeleton pulled when you're pulling mobs, if you get a higher level, level skeleton, you just swap it out. And the same thing is if they, they die, you go ahead and put these cards back in the, the proper stacks, you give the token back to the um, necromancer and they're ready to go. All right, so on to the monk. So to set up the monk, you wanna make sure that you draw your four chakra starting cards. You can see that they're chakra cards and it tells you they're your starting chakra down here to create your hand. So you have these four starting chakra cards. Then as usual, you go ahead and you take, you look at your first skills, you flip through them, you decide which skill that you want to have you put that skill somewhere near the hero dashboard. We're obviously not using hero dashboard for room. All right. You put the rest somewhere where the player can reach for leveling up later. So you look at this card and you add, it says gain chakra combat prowess. Now, you're going to take that card and add it to your hand that you have. So if you notice, there are three different types of chakra cards. There's Guidance, Agility, and Combat. And then you also have a Meditation card, which is not considered a um, card type. So going back to this, it tells us to go ahead and grab Combat, Prowess. 
So let's see, we have Guidance, Agility, Combat, and Vulnerability, no. Combat Pro S, and we add that to our hand. Go ahead and set these somewhere by the player board so the player can get their hands on them. All right, the next thing you do is you make sure the player has all their monk tokens. You have this token that has swords on one side, shield on the other, and you have these reroll tokens that have reroll on both sides. You can separate them, I like to do that, or put them all in one pile and dig them out later on. Now you're kind of ready to play. How the monk plays is at the start of a turn, they take one of their chakra cards and they go ahead and they play that chakra card. All right? So this card tells me that uh, when you play this chakra, gain one sword token for each active and discarded card. Well, we have no discarded cards yet. We have one active that would give us one active chakra or one, sorry, monk um, token with the uh, swords on it, All right? Now, what these, what the different things do, if you've played Massive Darkness, you kind of know this. Any sword gives you plus one to your attack. Any shield gives you plus one to your defense. And any one of these reroll symbols allows you to reroll one die. Now, on your turn, any hero, because sometimes other heroes might get these tokens, any hero can use the tokens that they've been given, that they have, and they can use as many as they want, right? So if you had, I don't know, let's say you have five, four tokens, how many do I have in my hand? Let's say you have five attack tokens. During an attack, you can waste all those tokens in one attack. Same with defense, same with rerolls, all those. You can use as many tokens as you have on your character board. All right. So let's say we've gone through all of our turns. We've played all of our cards, right? We've played a card for each turn. We still have a couple in our hand, but we didn't play them. So that, that is our hand. Now, at the start of the hero phase, the next hero phase, you keep these out. The start of the next hero phase, you go ahead and set these face up next to the discard pile, right? So if we argue that we already have cards discarded here, right? You have cards next to the discard pile. And the reason you wanna do that is for things like this card right here, where you're counting the cards that you have in your discard pile, all right? You wanna count how many cards that you have there. And that is basically how the monk works. All right, let's rock and roll with the bard. To set up, you want to make sure the bard has the musical dashboard. They have the three chord tokens and they put them in the upper leftmost spot of the board, the musical dashboard. You want to make sure the bard has the five note tokens. You also want to make sure that they have their starting skills and the player would take the top three starting skills. They would look at them, they would pick one and they would set it by the musical dashboard and then put these within reach so when they level up, they can go ahead and get them. Now you also want to go ahead and take out these musical items out of the loot decks. So for the common loot, you have the loot. For rare treasure, you have inspiring drums. And for epic treasure, you have the angelic flute. Now you take these, and you set them within the bard's reach, but they are not considered in the bard's inventory just yet. All right, once that's set up, you're pretty much ready to go. Now, to go ahead and set notes on the board, you what you wanna do is you wanna pay three mana. If you pay three mana, it allows you to put a note on the board. Now, when putting notes on the board, you can choose any column that you want to put a note on. The only restriction is you can't have two notes in the same column. Each note has to go in their own column. So for instance, let's say we're further into this game and this bard has all these notes going. They pay three mana, they have one last note, they decide to place it. They can't place it here, 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 or here. They have to place it here. 
Now, the other thing you can do is you can pay three mana to change your note position. So you pay three mana and you can change the note position. You can do this as much as you have mana to do it. It tells you right here, three mana, place or move your notes. All right, now for the chords. With the chords, at the beginning of the bard's turn, they take all three of them and they move them one spot to the right, the beginning of their turn. If they're already at the furthest right point, they go ahead and move that one over to the furthest left point, move these right there, so on and so forth. So just remember at the beginning of the turn, the chords move. Now, why we wanna do this is because it gives us songs that we can play, right? So right now, let's say we have something like this. We can leave these on here actually, it doesn't really matter. Let's say we have the three chords right here. This means that you could play songs that use those chords. So we have a G, we have a B, or sorry, we have a B and we have an E, right? That means we could play this song up here, um, the Tenacity Ballad. Now down here, it's G, E, E. We don't have two E's, so we wouldn't be able to play the um, Ballad of Vulnerability. Now, another thing to keep in mind to use these for these extra abilities, you have to have a musical instrument equipped. So you have a common one to start with, right? And then you have, as we've already shown, these um, musical instruments. So you have to make sure that you have a musical instrument equipped, and then you can go ahead and play songs and, and get the benefits from having your chords and your notes lining up. Now, how do you get these? The way you get these cards is you trade in a card of matching rarity, right? So for, if you wanted to get the loot, you would trade in two common cards. So you would get rid of the two common cards. Then you could take the loot and you can equip the loot. And then if you unequip the loot, that would go into your inventory at that point. Same with the rare, same with the epic. Now, I will say, keep in mind that consumables and starting equipment are considered common items. So arguably, um, the bard could trade these two things in for the loot. All right, the tinker. I thought the Necromancer had a lot going on. The Tinker has even more. So let's go ahead and dive into it. So as you see, we actually have a hero board out right now because I need it for examples. All right, so the setup for the Tinkers. First, you wanna go ahead and give them the six bombs. You have three large and three small bombs. You wanna place those near the hero board. Then you go ahead as usual. You give the player their deck of skill cards. They look through the level one skill cards, and they just go ahead and pick one, right? And they put it down next to the hero board, and they also put down, keep these in reach, because they're gonna level up, a double-sided reference guide, right? The Tinker Rule card, right? So it'll tell you about bombs and gizmos on the rule card. All right, once that's done, you go ahead and take the four double-sided exo armor pieces. So you have four of these tokens. Two of them are double-sided. These aren't, but it's because you have level one, you have level two, if you can see, and then you have level three. So you go ahead and grab all those, gather them up, set them next to the hero dashboard. All right, after that, you go ahead and you set the Exo Armor token next to the dashboard. So you have the Exo Armor token. Now, if you have the Dark Bringer pack, the Kickstarter extras, you get a miniature that represents the Exo Armor token. So you could go ahead and put that out if you wanted, but we'll kind of leave those to the side. All right, then you go ahead and take the six construct cards and put them out by the hero dashboard. So you have construct cards. You have level one, level two, level three. 
And you have that for each construct that you have. Then you put out the tokens for the constructs, right? And you put these out by the hero dashboard. And of course you can put it in any order you want. This is just so you guys can see it. All right. And just like the exo armor with the constructs, if you have the dark bringer pack, you also get a set of minis to represent the um, constructs. I like this one a lot. This one's fun with all of his arms. And then this one. Little century. All right. Once you have all that done, you're ready to go. All right, let's start with bombs. So how do we get bombs out? There are abilities and skills that allow you to put bombs out. So as you see here with this skill, it says um, you get rid of three mana or discard one item. You can't discard gizmos, and we'll, we'll get to that eventually. Just keep that in mind. You can't discard gizmos as your item, right? If you do that, you can place one small bomb in a magic range. That's your zone or one zone away. Now, you have the reference guide that tells you how to how those bombs work, right? So with this, if you put a small bomb out, you roll a yellow die. If you put a large bomb out, you roll an orange die. Now, when a bomb explodes, it explodes at the beginning of the enemy phase. And so what happens is you roll whichever die that represents the bomb you have there, you roll that die, and whatever it shows, every enemy, every sword means every enemy in that zone takes a hit. So if there were three enemies in the zone and I got that, each enemy would take one hit. Now, you can have multiple bombs in the zone and you can decide how the bombs go off, but you can't go to the next zone until you've used all the bombs in that zone. And of course, once a bomb goes off, it's gone. It just goes back to your stack of bombs that you can put out there. Remember in the game, all of the items that you have to use, um, like mana and health and stuff like that, there's a limited quantity. So if you have no bombs to put out and you want to put out bombs, you can't. All right, gizmos. So how gizmos work is you have to have a skill or ability that allows you to bring gizmos out. So let's say that our tinker actually chose this skill as their starting skill. Now this skill, it says, at the start of your turn, draw one token from the treasure bag and keep it as a gizmo. So this is how gizmos work. Whenever a skill or an ability tells the tinker to um, get a gizmo, you get into your treasure bag, you pull out a token, bink, and then that becomes your gizmo. You can have it with you for the rest of the quest. You can just kind of sit it there. You don't have to use it right away. Now, depending on the level of the treasure token, will tell you which gizmos that you can use. You have this on your gizmo reference card. So as you see right here, green can either be a smoke bomb, a cobble, cobbled wings, cobbled wings, um, or a carrier drone. Our blues can be holy hand explosive, uh, replicating gadget, or orb of darkness, right? And then we have our purple, or our rares. These can be lucky coin, frenzied device, and light bringer potion. Then down here, we also have the stuff for the campaign. I forget what these tokens are called, but they're white tokens, right? White and gold. And this is Blade Enhancer, Disposable Shield, and Gift Box, All right? So depending on what you take from the, um, the loot bag, the treasure bag, that dictates what kind of gizmo that your tinker has created. Now, each turn, you can only, or each round, sorry. No, each turn, each of the hero's turns getting mixed up now in my own head. Each of the hero's turns, you can only use one of these actions. So if you used a smoke bomb in one turn, the next turn you can't, or that next, your next turn, your next action, you can't use a smoke bomb again. You can only use one smoke bomb for that turn. Now you can save it and use it in a later turn. 
Once you've used that gizmo, right, which is represented by these tokens, you go ahead and take it and you throw it in the bag. Now keep in mind, even though gizmos pull those loot tokens, which are kind of like items, you cannot use them at the forge to upgrade and other things as we talk about. Or you remember, you can't discard a gizmo to um, be able to get a bomb out. So just keep that in mind. All right, exo armor. So here we have the exo armor here. How our tinker puts on the exo armor is they have to have the skill. Let's see if I set this up correctly. There we go. So let's say the um, hero, the tinker, we're at the point where they have at least two skills. They've leveled up at least one more time. So what this says on this card, right? It says discard three items, gain one of the parts of the exo armor one, right? So you'd have to get rid of three armor. Remember, this cannot be gizmos. You can't get rid of gizmos, right? But you can get rid of things that you have here, things that you have in your inventory next to your board. You get rid of three items, and then you can choose either the upper or lower part of the XO armor, right? If you choose the upper part, you get rid of anything that's in that area and you put it in. These things go into your inventory. They're not gone, you just they just go to your inventory. If you choose the bottom, same thing, you'd get rid of anything down in these slots along here and you would put the XO armor down in here. Same thing, these just go into your bag of items, however you wanna look at it, right? They're not gone. So let's go ahead and say we put on some bottoms. All right, so once you do that, you go ahead and put the token out on the board with your um, character, with the tinker that has the exo suit on, or at least half of it on as a reminder, or you could always take your um, tinker off the board and you have your little exo armor guy that can go out there on the board. All right, so some things to know with the exo armor. The exo armor um, has no item tier. There's no item tier related to this exo armor. The exo armor cannot be traded with the other heroes. It tells you this on the card. Um, and the exo armor parts cannot be discarded unless otherwise stated. So you can't get rid of them. You could take them off if you want but you can't get rid of them, you can't discard them for any reason. It's usually to make things, right? All right, constructs. So, to activate a construct, you need a, a skill or ability that allows you to do that. And I think I set this right. So here we go, so here's a skill. So let's say our hero has leveled up at least two more times. So now they have construct one, right? What this tells you is discard two items. These can't be gizmos and place one construct in your zone. Well, right? So action, destroy one construct and place one small bomb in its zone. So you can do that with this one. So you're limited to one construct. And you only have three constructs that you can have out at a time. Remember, tokens are limited. So if you level up high enough, you can have three constructs out on the board. Now, how the construct works is you go ahead and take the token, you put it on the board, and remember, you have the miniatures too that represent your uh, different little constructs, right? So you'd go ahead and you would take the token and you put it on the board. The construct gets one free action, right? And then after that, you can use your actions to get the construct to um, either move or attack. And they are considered just like heroes, except for they don't open doors, they don't interact with objects, they don't carry things, things like that. They don't count as mobs and health and things like that. But they're seen as heroes. They can be attacked, they can attack. So when they move, if they use an action to move, they get two movement points like normal. And if they attack or defend, you just refer to the card. So this would be a construct level one, right? You put it out on the, you put this next to you so you know what you have out there. You put the token on the board. This gives you your defense. This gives you your attack. And they have melee defense plus one shield. So then they have special abilities too. If the construct is destroyed, it goes back into your stack. 
because you can construct more of these and you just, next time you get the option, you go ahead and put a new construct out. Now, the Tinker has special campaign mode rules. So let's just run over those really quick. And this is if you're playing the campaign. If not, you can ignore and jump forward. So the special rules for the Tinker in campaign mode is before the town phase, the Tinker gets rid of any gizmo tokens they're holding and returns them back to the treasure bag. Each part of the exo armor is considered one item. So this is considered one item. The top would be considered um, one item. Uh, for the limit for starting a quest, how many items you can have. And then last but not least, the Blacksmith 2 and Blacksmith 3, um, when playing campaign mode, the heroes cannot um, never count as a forge. Your hero can never count as a forge, not the heroes. So you can't use those to allow your hero to be a forge. All right, the Druid. So to set up for the Druid, you want to make sure that you put out the Druid dashboard. Then you want to put out the miniatures and place them on their corresponding spot. You have the name and you have an image. So you have Eagle, Bear, and Raccoon. Then you want to go ahead and get the Druid tokens and put them on the board. So you start at two. You can also tell there's a white circle around. So you put them at two for each one. So you have Ferocity, Brawn, and flow tracks. You go ahead and put those track markers down or the druid markers down. Then as usual, you make sure the player has their deck of skills. And then the player goes through the skills and they pick a skill and go ahead and put it down next to their dashboard, their druid dashboard. Make sure the rest of the skills are within reach. So as usual, usual these skills add to what you can do with these tracks. That's why it's good to put the track matching the skill. All right, so how does this work? The board actually tells us right off the bat, at the start of your turn, you increase right, all the tracks by one of forms that you're not. Right now, your person, your druid's running around the board. They're not in any of these forms, so they would all be increased. Now let's say for some reason, your druid, you already had the eagle out, and your druid little players right here. This one wouldn't advance, but you would still advance brawn and then flow. All right, so it also tells us up here that during your turn, once per round, you may transform. So once per round, during your form, you can transform. And so what happens when you transform, you go ahead and take your druid from wherever they are in the dungeon. Well, scratch that, do it this way. Take whatever form you want, let's say you get the eagle, you put it in the same zone as the druid, then you take the druid miniature and put it in the eagle slot. As soon as the eagle or any of the transform animals go out, you have transformation, right? So you have transformation peck, transformation roar, and transformation assist. You immediately do this action under here for free. Then after that, you have the same, you can attack with actions, you can move, which gives you certain things, except for the different forms have different um, disabilities or different disadvantages, right? So for the eagle, you can't recover, trade, interact, or open doors. If you're in bear form, you can't recover, and you only have one movement point. Now that changes if someone else gives you a movement point or you have a movement point for some other reason. But instead of two with the bear, you only have one movement point. And then with the raccoon, you can't recover or attack. So just remember that. These are hindrances that you have, but you also have these abilities that you perform right away. Then the next thing that you can do is down here, you can go ahead and spend, so it says, spend a um, eagle point, right? A druid point for eagle or a ferocity point, and you can reroll a die result, right? And they all have different ones. Um, you do a brawn one, you decrease it by one, you spend one, you ignore one of the enemy dice. And then over here, you can decrease by one and you get one extra movement. Now, there's one other thing to keep in mind with the Druid. It's actually two other things. So if you're changing back to 
human form or you're changing one of your animal forms, you go ahead and you take the form that you're changing out of. So in this case, if we wanted to change out of the back to the druid, we'd take the druid off the board, put them in the same zone as the eagle miniature, and then bring the eagle miniature and set them back where they go. Now you can also decide to change form to form. So you can go ahead and say, oh, I want to change the bear. Go ahead and take the bear off, set the bear in the zone where the eagle is, go ahead and move the druid over to the bear slot, take the eagle and put them back in their corresponding spot. Now the last thing is for campaign mode. And it's just kind of a clarification it tells you on the card. But you have more cards, more levels when it comes to campaign mode. It goes up to 10. I have 10 off to the side, right? So what this is telling you is in bear form, you're required to have these skills, but you spend not just bear or the brawn track tokens. You don't spend the brawn points. In this one, you would spend one ferocity, one brawn, and one flow, and it allows you to do this down here, which is roll a shadow die. For each sword you rolled, you gain something, right? For each um, face, you gain something. So, ooh, see if that zeroes in. The one thing to keep in mind with this is that you have to be in that animal form, but you're going to be spending different animal or different tracks connected to the animals to get that to trigger. All right, so that is all the hero classes for the hero and monster sets for Massive Darkness 2. So what we had here was the monk in the necromancers versus Paragon. We have the bards and the tinkers versus the metal angel. And then we have the druids versus Beelzebub. I hope you guys enjoyed. I'm Steven with Cardboard Coalition. Help us grow the coalition by liking, commenting, subscribing, hitting the bell notification, doing all that YouTube stuff. I'll catch you in the next one. Bye.